All right. Now we're at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. So we'll go from there then. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Now remember, in this uh, Bible study, we're doing verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, word for word. That's how we do our Bible study here. That way, each and every word you can fully understand. You'll hear from people that the Bible's too hard to understand, so you need an updated version or a modern Bible version. That's not true. The Word of God, which is the King James Bible, you'd be surprised that you'll be able to understand it. Sure, at first you have to take some effort and look at a dictionary, but you'll be surprised uh, how much easier it is than you think. Besides, who can understand the Word of the Lord, right? At your own human rationality. So it takes effort, it takes study. This is why this Bible study is important, which is a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. Here I am explaining each and every word to you. So all you have to do is to see if my explanation matches a verse. So you're going to notice that. A lot of my explanations might sound even dull to you because you might go, well, I already know that. Well, great. Then that means you understood that part of the verse. See? So it's not that hard for you to under understand. So please do pay attention to my explanation. See if it matches each and every word that I'm interpreting. And besides, like... I always say, I could be lying to you, right? I could be tricking you. So you need to look at the verse and then see for yourself. And if anybody, obviously, I am always happy to answer questions. If people have questions or concerns after Bible study, please do come to me. Amen. It is my job to explain the Word of God correctly. Amen? All right, now let's look at Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So that's pretty self-explanatory. The author is telling the believers to make sure that the way you follow Jesus Christ, as a follower of Christ, you follow what is peaceable with everybody you're around with. And make sure that you follow and seek after holiness, all right? Don't go after or follow your own flesh or other things in this world because these two things are necessary, living peaceably with everybody and living a clean life so that you can see the Lord. If you don't have these two things, then you won't be able to see God. Now, every commentator messes up in this passage. What people naturally assume from this verse is that it's more of like a spiritual thing. Now remember, that's the most dangerous interpretation method of the Bible, is spiritual interpretation, meaning allegorical, meaning what you should take literally, you spiritualize it all the time. Now remember, I believe in spiritual interpretation. I actually think it could become the most important. You might recall that, right? But remember, What's the most important to the Lord could be also the most abused by the devil, right? And can become the worst. So, in verse 14, so many commentators spiritualize a passage when you should be taking it literally. They think that, no, you have to follow peaceably with everybody and live a clean life. That way you can spiritually see God, whatever that means. But no, this is literally seeing God. Recall, what's the title of the book? Is it called Christians or Hebrews? Already, that's a no-brainer. Now, remember, in the beginning of our Hebrews Bible study, what's the time period? Tribulation, right? So these are Jews undergoing the tribulation. Now, you hear me say dispensationalism quite often. Remember, what that means is we believe in different time periods in the Bible. So when God is speaking in the Bible, He's not speaking to everybody at all at one time period. Sometimes when he speaks something in the Bible, it's only to Old Testament. Sometimes when he says something in the Bible, it's only in the church age, which is us, obviously, today. Sometimes when he speaks in the Bible, it's only for the tribulation saints. Sometimes when he speaks in the Bible, it's for the millennium. Sometime in the future when the nation of Israel gets their kingdom back. So you notice a lot of Orthodox Jews, rabbis, waiting for their Messiah to return to set up a physical, literal kingdom. Yeah, we Christians believe in that. But the only difference with us and those Jews is that we know that there's a church age. Those Jews don't know that. 
So we believe that sometime in the future. So we he see here Old Testament church age tribulation and obviously the end, which is the millennial kingdom, 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. He restores the nation of Israel. That's what the Orthodox Jews are waiting for. But I didn't include that here because we're not going to really talk about that. He is speaking to Hebrews in the tribulation. Now, if he is speaking to them, the question is, if they live peaceably and if they keep seeking after holiness, then is it possible they will literally see the Lord? Yes. It's called the second advent. So this is Jesus Christ in his first coming. This is what we call the first advent. Then there's the second advent. The second advent is when Jesus Christ literally comes down on the earth. Now, you notice that the church is not here during the tribulation. We go up, we get raptured to see Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, when he literally comes down on the earth, this is after the rapture. This is after the tribulation. So when Jesus Christ comes down, whether during or after the tribulation, it don't matter, but it's in the tribulation that he comes down. <clears throat> uh, oh, excuse me. They have their rapture uh, in the middle of the tribulation, and then he comes down afterwards. But uh, that's, I just now lost you, so forget what I just said, all right? Some of you who are new to this might go, what are you talking about? There's a second rapture? Yeah, but that's a different story. So just for, scratch what I said, all right? I'm trying to make this as simple as I can. Bottom line is he's, Jesus Christ is going to be coming down on the earth during the tribulation, sometime at the end. So they're going to see him. When they see him, then we have to look at the context here. So let's go to Hebrews 4, uh, Hebrews 9, excuse me, Hebrews 9. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9, and let's look at verse 28. Look at the context. Notice that the author is telling those Hebrews that Jesus Christ, he's going to come down the second time. See, that's the second advent. But he says, if you're looking for him, you will literally look for him when he comes down. <clears throat> Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, remember Hebrews 12, no man shall see the Lord. So if you're going to look for him, you're going to see him. If you look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So they're going to be literally seeing him. That's why this makes sense. Go to Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5. Now, all of you have heard of the famous Sermon on the Mount, but so many churches get that wrong. The Sermon on the Mount is not for the Christian church. Notice the Sermon on the Mount is all about the kingdom of heaven. It's not the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's not a Christian gospel, it's a kingdom gospel. I mean, a lot of people, when they hear gospel, they assume that means Christian. No, gospel simply means good news. And by the way, you got four gospels in your Bible, right? Yeah. What are the four gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. See, so gospel doesn't mean same thing. Gospel just simply means good news. So. This is the gospel of the kingdom being preached, not the gospel, not the Christian gospel of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you look at chapter 4, verse 23, let's look at context. Chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus is preaching the gospel of the what? Kingdom, right? Yeah. Is that correct? I could be lying to you, so look at your Bible, right? 4, verse 23, gospel of the kingdom. That's what it says. So as he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, chapter 5, that's why he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See that? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You notice all of that? This is all a kingdom gospel. <clears throat> Look at verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. Doesn't that match with Hebrews 12? Yes. Follow after holiness, right? That way what? You can see God. What is this? This is literally seeing God. 
Because notice it's a kingdom gospel. People, when they see kingdom of heaven, they assume that's just literally dying and going to heaven. No, you'll notice right here, Jesus said at verse 5, they shall inherit the earth. Yeah. See that? Mm -hmm. So this has to do with a heavenly kingdom on earth. Heavenly kingdom on earth. Even the Catholic Church knew that, and Hollywood even knew that. Didn't you know that? They have a movie titled Kingdom of Heaven. What do you think they meant by that? Dying and going to heaven? No, they meant uh, their, their heavenly kingdom on earth. That's why they were so brutal with the Crusades, and it's so sad how many people died for the name of Jesus and m people murdered for the name of Jesus. Jesus had nothing to do with that. Amen. That ain't the kingdom Amen. of heaven. Kingdom of heaven ain't built until after tribulation, not during the church. When you hear churches talking about a kingdom gospel, they don't realize what they're promoting. They're promoting a bloody gospel, a murder gospel. That has nothing to do with the church. Church is not building a heavenly kingdom on earth. But you notice they're trying to do that. That is set up by Jesus Christ himself after the tribulation. That's what those Jews were waiting for. See, after the world goes under the kingdom of the Antichrist. One world government, new world order, all that evil. Jesus Christ is setting up the kingdom to wipe them out. See that? That's the warfare. That's the actual crusade that should take place. It's to wipe out the satanic kingdom. But so many innocent lives were lost during the dark ages, all for the name of Jesus, when Jesus had nothing to do with it. That was all Amen. the devil. That was all the devil. So we realize and understand over here that the kingdom of heaven, which is heavenly kingdom on earth, that takes place when what? When Jesus Christ comes down, second advent, wipes out <clears throat> the antichrist kingdom during the tribulation, sets up a heavenly kingdom on the earth. And, there, and those people who are poor because they cannot buy food during the antichrist reign, right? Because they don't take the mark of the beast. People who are suffering persecution during the Antichrist kingdom. Why? Because they won't worship him. All those people, that's why the Lord gives favoritism toward them. See, the Lord doesn't give favoritism today toward like only poor people. He doesn't do that today. Because as we all know, whether you're rich or poor, hardworking or lazy or something like that, it doesn't matter. Uh, there's no favoritism or specialty there. But why is it that God said rich people are damned, poor people are saved? Why are there verses like that? Unless it's what? He's talking about this time period. So it's during, see, you notice a lot of churches are using verses wrongly. There's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with being rich at all. There's nothing wrong with being poor either. It's, a poor person doesn't, is not better than a rich, and a rich per person is not better than a poor. It doesn't do it that way. But during the tribulation, it's very different. Because those who are worshiping, serving God, see, they're starving to death. They don't get money. And God says, hold on to your righteousness, see? Hold on to holiness. Don't worship the Antichrist. Keep holding on, and that way you can see me when I come down, set up the kingdom, and then I reward you for your efforts. See, that makes a way more sense. Amen. Way more sense. <clears throat> So this is all a kingdom of heaven gospel. So when you go back to Hebrews 12, so here's a little bit of the confusing thing, okay? Why commentators will think that this is referring to Christians who are seeking after going to heaven rather than a heavenly kingdom on earth is perhaps because of this verse. When we go to Hebrews 12, notice the context at verse 22, 22. <clears throat> But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God. The what? Heavenly Jerusalem. See, it's not an earthly Jerusalem. It's heavenly. Uh, and to innumerable company of what? Angels, not humans. So that's why commentators make that mistake. Because from this verse, it seems like it's talking about dying and going to heaven. So that's why you got to live holy. That way you can see God. So that's what they assume. They don't think that this is talking about a heavenly kingdom on earth. Now, how do we know this is a heavenly kingdom on earth? How do we know that this is the same thing as Matthew 5? Well, go back to Matthew 5. Go back to Matthew 5. 
you got to be careful with verses. There are verses that talk about going to heaven, which is up there, not on the earth. But there are verses, get this now, listen, there are verses that talks about a heavenly kingdom that culminates heaven and earth together. Why? Because literally up in heaven, it's a heavenly kingdom. And when God sets up a kingdom on the earth, it is a heavenly kingdom. Right. See that? Why? Because one day God's not just going to rule only in heaven, but he's going to rule on the earth as well. So notice in Matthew 5, it talks not only about a kingdom in the earth, but a kingdom literally up in heaven. So look at Matthew 5 again. Now remember, this is the gospel of the kingdom of heaven in verse 3, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? So look at this. Uh, look at verse 5. That's earthly. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the heaven, the earth. This is an earthly kingdom. But look at this. It's not just earthly. Look at uh, verse 12. Verse 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in earth. Is that right? No, it's in where? Up there. So what's going on? Because... It makes, this proves more, this is the millennial kingdom. All right, I'm convinced. I got to draw the millennium. If I don't draw that, everyone's not going to understand. Yeah, we need pictures, yeah. All right, there we go. You are here, okay? <laughs> so we don't get lost. So in this uh, millennium kingdom, the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ, he comes down from heaven to the earth, sets up a kingdom on the earth. So now he has a heavenly kingdom that encompasses everything, earth and heaven. Notice Matthew 9. Go to Matthew, 9, uh, Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Matthew 6, get this, is not the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6 is continuing the Sermon on the Mount from chapter 5. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is look at the last verse of chapter 5. Notice Jesus keeps on talking. He didn't end. When he finishes talking is at the end of chapter 7. You're going to find that out, okay? So he just keeps uh, firing away. So in chapter 6, look at the Lord's Prayer. So the Lord's Prayer is not for Christians then. It's a kingdom gospel. When many Christians are praying the Lord's Prayer, they're praying it incorrectly. That's not for them. That's for those in the tribulation who are waiting for that kingdom of heaven on the earth, that heavenly kingdom on the earth. They're praying for that. They're starving. They're in poverty. They need provision. So that's why they give the Lord's Prayer, which is, look at Matthew 6. And then uh, notice right here in verse 9. Verse 9, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, what? See, they're waiting for that kingdom to come. Thy will be done in what? In earth as it is in heaven. See that? So it's a heavenly kingdom that's about to land on the earth. That's what they're all anticipating. That's why they're giving the Lord's Prayer. So people who are praying the Lord's Prayer right now, you're in the wrong time period. You're going to be praying that if you're undergoing the tribulation. But I'll tell you what, if you're saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you don't have to go through that. You don't even have to go through the Lord's Prayer. You don't have to be scared of the Antichrist. You can get raptured up to heaven. But there's going to be a lot of people who, when they see Christians raptured, they're going to go, oh, wow, they were telling me the truth. And so they're going to get saved. But salvation in the tribulation is a lot harder than this one. Here, they have to resist the mark of the beast. They're going to be starving, going through poverty. They got to maintain the holiness and leave a peace, uh, live a peaceable life so that they can get to see God. Because if they don't hold out to the end, then they'll just yield into the Antichrist system and then they'll lose their salvation. Christians don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about losing our salvation because we're not going to go through the tribulation. We believe that all it takes to get saved is not the kingdom gospel. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul's gospel, founded in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is what? By simply believing 
He died for your sins, buried and resurrected to save you. If you Amen. only trust on that alone, not your good works, not following peace and holiness like Hebrew says. Amen. It's not that. All you're doing is putting your faith on what Jesus Christ did on the cross. By doing that, you're sealed, you're secured, you're saved, you're going to heaven no matter what. Glory to God. Bible verses that talks about doing works or losing salvation, you'll notice they're connected to a Jewish theme, Jewish kingdom theme. You'll notice that. Why? Because during that time, they better endure. They shouldn't yield to the satanic, uh, Satan's kingdom, the Antichrist. Okay, now that we understand that, here's another one. Go to Matthew 13. <clears throat> Matthew 13. There is no doubt that the book of Hebrews, it is talking about a millennial kingdom heavenly kingdom on earth sometime in the future which the Jews the Jews the Hebrews are waiting for remember the book is titled Hebrews right Jews those Jews are waiting for that heavenly kingdom on the earth now notice what Jesus said about the kingdom of heaven uh, when you look at uh, Matthew chapter 13 verse 24 24 another parable put he forth unto them saying the kingdom of what Okay, this is a kingdom of heaven parable. So he's going to tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. Liken unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the weed and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Okay, then we look at verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, what's the meaning with this parable? Jesus explains to you what the kingdom of heaven is. So he explains it when we look at verse 36. 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. All right, here's your answer. This is how you know the kingdom of heaven is an earthly kingdom. When Jesus Christ comes in the world at the end times to set up a kingdom. This is evidence. Keep reading. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man, Jesus. Okay, so there's a sower. The field is the world. Okay, so that's the earth, the field that he's putting seed on. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Oh, oh, notice right here. These are people who can enter Jesus' kingdom then. Okay, that's another uh, note. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Oh, they belong to the Antichrist, the devil. You notice that? By the way, Cross-reference that word wicked one or wicked, That's right. or who are you going to find? The Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2. Amen. So it's Satan incarnate here. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, no problem. The harvest is the what? Oh, I told you so, it's the end times. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather... Out of his what? Kingdom. kingdom, all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. Why, that's not referring to up in heaven. Right. Come on. Jesus doesn't have sinners or wicked people up in heaven. <laughs> What's his kingdom talking about? When he comes down on the earth, Amen. sets up a kingdom on the earth, he's cleaning up the wicked people there who sided with the Antichrist, Satan incarnate, the wicked one. And he's put, damning them to Gehenna or hell. And the good guys, he lets them enter the kingdom. That's why he calls them children of the kingdom. This is all what? Church age. No, end times. End times. This doctrine dispensationalism is so crucial. You're gonna, I'm going to pretty much guarantee that 100% or 99% of churches you go to, you don't hear dispensationalism like this. Or if they do teach dispensationalism, it's just uh, in uh, very small indications that you can't really tell. So I'm not obvious. Obviously, I'm not saying we're the only church that's right and everybody's wrong. No, there's plenty of, there's thousands of Bible believers, 
hundreds of Bible-believing churches around the world. But like the Bible says, when you go by location and geography, it's a minority. It's no doubt a minority. All right, now when we go back to Hebrews, book of Hebrews, this doctrine, you realize how important it is, it is incredibly eye-opening. It makes a lot more sense. Amen. All right, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> Uh, we go to verse 15 now. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. So let's go by context. Follow peace with all men and holiness. All right, so the author is telling the Hebrews during the tribulation, make sure you live peaceably with everybody. Make sure you live a clean life. Otherwise, you're not going to see Jesus when he sets up his kingdom. So... Verse 15, keep looking diligently. Yeah, they got to keep their eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep looking at him. Otherwise, you're going to fail God's grace in your life. So in other words, when we talk about looking to Jesus, you're going to fail God's grace on your life. And there are two other definitions, but we're going to concentrate this one. It's salvation and all the benefits that accompanied it. So these Tribulation Jews, they have to keep looking at Jesus up to his coming when he comes at the second advent. So they have to set their eyes on him, not at the Antichrist, not focus on the things of the world, because when you're starving to death, that's going to be very tempting. So you have to look diligently. That's what the verse says. So you got to look very diligently. Otherwise, what? You're going to fail God's salvation by grace in your life. So that's why they got to keep keep it up. They're going to lose the inheritance, the benefits with that one as well. So they have to keep looking hard. Now you'll notice right here, if that's what looking means, then notice right here, how are you, how are you, let's say, here is the beginning of the tribulation. You're obviously, Jesus didn't Christ come down yet, all right? You're at the beginning here. Jesus Christ is coming down here. Why, if Jesus Christ didn't come down yet, how can they literally see him, right? That don't make sense. So the commentators, they are partially right here. So listen to this, all right? But they're not, they don't have the complete picture. When you're looking at Jesus, correct, you are spiritually looking for him. But it's more literal than you think. That's the complete definition. So let me repeat that again. Looking to Jesus is spiritual, but it is more literal than you think. You start out by constantly looking at Jesus as best as you can, even though you don't see him literally. But one day, those eyes of faith turn into literal sight. So what you see Jesus by faith, it'll literally turn into Jesus himself when he comes down. That's the idea. So as I keep looking at Jesus, let's say I'm a Jew in the tribulation. I constantly look at Jesus Christ. I focus on Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist, not the wicked things in this world. I just set my eyes on Jesus Christ. I keep doing that until I literally see him one day. That's the idea, okay? That's what a tribulation saint is doing, which is why it makes sense by context when we go all the way back to Hebrews 12, verse 2, remember that famous verse? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our what? Faith. Faith. So there is a spiritual context. So the commentators are partially right in that point. There is spiritual seeing, but the spiritual turns into literal. That's what we got to understand. So they neglected that part. So by faith, see, you don't literally see him. By faith, you see Jesus Christ until one day you see him in his physical form when he comes down. That's the whole idea. <coughs> Excuse me. We understand that's the case with tribulation saints. Now, what about church age saints? What about Christians, right? So a lot of people don't know this, but the book of Hebrews, if you go from... Uh, Oh, how do I say this easily? They're called general epistles, let's just say, okay? Hebrews through the book of Jude. A lot of people don't know these are transitional epistles. 
In other words, they are directed to two audiences here. It is Jews in the tribulation, but it is mingled up with Christian doctrine. Now, some of you might say, why is that? So I'm not going to go on a whole history, all right? But just real briefly, you might recall during the time after Jesus Christ died and until Paul came, the Apostle Paul was the one who introduced the Christian gospel very clearly. It was from Paul. Before Paul, it was going Jew to Gentile. Jew to Gentile. That's why Jesus Christ, when he was preaching on the earth, he was ministering to Jews, preaching a kingdom gospel. But the Jews were rejecting him. But the Gentiles were receiving him. Hence, because God was turning to the Gentiles, that's why Paul came. And Paul is known as the apostle to the Gentiles. Not to the Jews, the Gentiles. He's known as the apostle of the Gentiles. He ministered to some Jews here and there, but his main ministry was Gentiles. We know that. So once he switched to Paul, that's when he introduced the Christian doctrine. See that? And obviously for the past 2,000 years, you notice that God is no longer dealing with the Jews. He's dealing with the Christian church. If a Jew wants to get saved, they have to join our crowd here, the Christian church. But once we get out of the picture, God goes back to the Jews, the nation of Israel. That's why you notice what's going on right now with Israel. Why is such a small place there's so much worldwide attention? Because God knows they will have worldwide attention in the end times. It will happen. See, he's almost, the church age clock is almost done. It's about to close. That's why if you're not saved, now would be a great time to get saved. Now would be a great time to get saved. So you need to get saved because that clock is almost done. And once God switches to the nation of Israel, you and I are going to be gone. The church is gone. So too late to get saved by grace through faith. If you're going to be stuck here, you're going to have to do a lot of work and it's going to be a nightmare under the Antichrist. So you don't want to go through that. Easiest time to get saved is now. Easiest time. Easiest time to get saved is now. Understanding that, then we realize right here when we switch from Jew to Gentile, notice that it was switching. God, he didn't, when he was switching from Jew to Gentile, he did it gradually. Okay? So because he was doing it gradually, there was a mingling of Jewish tribulation doctrine as well as Christian doctrine undergoing that time. So that's the transitional era of the first centuries of Christianity. That's what was going on. This is why it makes so much sense that uh, Bart Ehrman and other uh, unsaved liberal scholars, when they talk about the Bible, they say that it's strange. Jesus and the apostles, they had their own brand of apocalyptic Jewish teachings that was different from typical Judaism, which is true. Yeah. Why? Because you're hearing that right now. This is end times teaching here for the Jews. That's what Jesus Christ and the apostles were preaching, the kingdom gospel. See that? Not Orthodox Judaism 101. That's not what they were doing. Yeah. They were teaching apocalyptic Jewish stuff. Yeah, they're right. They just don't know dispensationalism. So they don't know that much, see? And then the uh, Muslims and Bart Ehrman and a lot of people, they say that today's Christian church, they get their teachings from Paul, not from Jesus. Well, they're partially right because Paul was the one who introduced Christian teaching. So they're partially right on that one. But they're untrue about Jesus and the apostles because the, Jesus, he obviously introduced some Christian teachings as well, which Paul took out of, but then he introduced it and spread it even more so. He boosted it. He gave more. Jesus, he only gave a little bit, but he was primarily focusing on what? Apocalyptic uh, Jewish teachings. So see that? This makes a lot more sense when you have dispensationalism. They just don't know that teaching, that doctrine. That's the, that's the number one doctrine everyone should know. By doing that, you'll, you'll free yourself from 99% of wrong doctrine. Okay, now that I say all this jibber-jabber, blah, 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 the point is, the book of Hebrews, expect a mingling of elements of apocalyptic Jewish teachings with Christian doctrine teachings. Okay? So... 
If this has some Christian teaching, what parts can we see as a Christian? So let's take a look at that. Well, uh, verse 14, we could probably see right here that uh, obviously Christians should live peaceably as they could, right? We should follow after holiness. Now, if you don't see the Lord, then okay, only spiritually we get that, right? There are times when you don't live holy. When, there are times when you don't live peaceably in your life that spiritually you do not see God in your life. Sometimes people even doubt their salvation. But if you are a saved Christian, when you die, you will literally see Jesus. So that part has no application to us. But if you want to see spiritually seeing Jesus, then we can get that. So in verse 2, that's why Christians quote that quite often. As what? Spiritually looking at Jesus Christ. Not literally, like the tribulation Jews. So, we're, so we have to constantly keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. It's hard. I mean, the Christian life ain't easy. I know that tribulation is horrible. You don't want to go through it. But let's admit it, too. The church age life ain't easy either. There are hardships we go through. There are things that are difficult in this life. Temptations all around you 24-7. And then it's hard to just believe, just have faith that what Jesus did for you, that heaven, you know, its rewards are better than the earthly rewards and just staying in the state straight and narrow and just living clean, right? It's hard to do that. It's hard to keep a clean testimony. So that's why you have to keep looking at Jesus diligently. Otherwise, you're going to fail God's grace. In what way? Not salvation. All right, and the benefits, like the tribulation Jews. Because when we have salvation, like I told you, we're secured, we're sealed. <clears throat> but grace, it doesn't only mean salvation, obviously. Grace has multiple meanings. Right. Here we can see it means to get help. So that's Hebrews chapter 4, all right? We're not going to turn there for time's sake. But the verse talks about, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Uh, th that we may find grace to help in time of need. So in other words, we're receiving help from Jesus Christ when we pray to him and ask him for help, right? So that's a grace. The second one is strength, strength. That's found at 2 Corinthians 12, 2 Corinthians 12. Paul, <clears throat> yet he was going through a health problem, but God never cured him. And God instead said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Meaning that, hey, Paul, I'm not going to heal you of this disease because my grace in your life, the grace that you can have to endure and go through the pain is more than enough for you. So grace is, is in reference to strength as well, in, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It is strength to bear through the trials in your life. So in this case, think about it then. Doesn't it make sense? If you start off with Hebrews 12, 2, and if you start off with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 through 15, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the, Christ, endured the cross, despising the shame, yeah. follow peace with all men, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently. So here you are. You got to keep up your Christian race. You got to keep looking diligently at Jesus Christ. But if you fail to do that, what's going to happen? You don't feel like you're getting help from the Lord. Come on. See, God's grace is failing in your life. That's good, brother. Come on. How many of us feel like that, that we are not getting the help we need? A lot of times you, you got to ask yourself, am I looking at Jesus? Second thing. You don't have enough strength, do you? Come on, brother, yeah. Yeah, good preaching. Yeah, amen, amen. You know why you don't have enough strength to endure the trial and pain you're going through? You're not looking at Jesus. There's your answer. So you need to keep looking at Jesus Christ so you can find the strength to endure through. Otherwise, let me ask you this question. This is just a duh, uh, duh example, okay? If all you're looking at is temptation and sin, doom and gloom, and that's all you're seeing, 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 seeing. Without Jesus Christ in your mind, are you really going to have strength to go through the end of the day? It's just that simple. It's just common sense. But while you're going through the pain, if you think about what Jesus did for you on the cross, 
how he suffered, that gives you at least something inside, right, to pull through and makes you get some kind of either motivation or you kick yourself or you just get something to keep pushing yourself, right? There's your strength. Same thing with help, too. You get help. I mean, let's be honest. When you sing hymns about Jesus Christ bleeding and dying, you don't get any help? Yeah, you get help. You get help a lot. That's looking unto Jesus. Amen. So we're not mid-acts hyper-dispensational and saying that this is only for tribulation Jew. We're not going to get anything out of this. No, then you're going to miss out a blessing, right? You're going to miss out a blessing. There is Christian teaching here. <clears throat> now, if we look at verse 15, so we got to keep looking diligently. Set our eyes at Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you're going to fail God's grace in your life that can sustain you, that can help you, give you strength. But here's another problem. Another problem is not only you fail God's grace, but you fall into bitterness. Let's keep reading. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. So the author is using bitterness like a root underneath the ground that springs up out eventually. And when bitterness, when it is kept inside and eventually comes out, it's going to trouble your life. All right. So notice I'm trying to explain every word in that verse. So make sure my explanation mat matches up. And thereby many be defiled. Oh, not only that, thereby the consequence of this is it's going to spread to many other people around you, your bitterness, and defile, corrupt them. Bitterness, what it does is, uh, let's talk about three things here, which is very, uh, very good lessons on bitterness. Now, this is the, one of the number one texts that people use for lessons on bitterness, actually. So this is one of those must verses that you want to keep in mind regarding bitterness. Bitterness, what we notice right here is, I like how it said it's a root. What does that mean? Like I mentioned to you before, it's hiding underground. You don't see it. And you're not going to hold it forever. You're not going to hide it forever if you got bitterness. Eventually, it's going to spring up. It's going to break through that ground one day. So that's a very dangerous thing about bitterness, which you don't want. And guess what? It does trouble you, doesn't it? It does spread out and corrupt other people. One thing I noticed, this is very bad in any church. I don't care if you're in a Bible-believing church. I don't even care if you're in our church. Every church, this happens nearly all the stinking time. Every church, it's a, it happens. Every single church. What happens is so-and-so gets some root of bitterness. No one has any idea because it's hidden pretty well. But guess what? You think you hide it pretty well, you're not going to hide it pretty well. Eventually, it's going to spring out. And when it springs out, it infects somebody. And what people want is somebody to side with the bitter person. And then th there's World War III going on in the church. That's an infectious, horrible wicked thing that you want to get rid of. You know how you get rid of bitterness? Pluck it up by the roots. So when you pluck it up by the roots, it's an introspection in your heart. You see that? See, bitterness is not because of what you said outwardly. Everybody looks at that one. It's the before stage, how it started, underground. What was brewing underground in your heart? When you have an introspection in your heart, what happens is then you realize that there are some things you're just too sensitive on. There are just some things that you need to learn that I need to let go. There are other things that there's something you deeply care about, but something trampled on that. And because of that, you get bitter. But you got to realize that the one you should care about the most is God's will upon your life. Amen. What he wants you to do. And if there's something else that's above him, see that? Then you will be bitter in the future. Because all it takes is some tragic event, some suffering, or somebody out there that's going to trample upon the thing that you deeply care about. And by the way, I think you all can agree in this Christian life that we live in, basic Christian 
101 teaching is that we all go through some kind of trampling in our life where something that we care about is tested by God and trampled upon. So if your heart's not ready for that, then just get ready for bitterness instead. That's why you got to pluck it up by the roots. You got to go down deep inside the ground, find what it is that causes you to be bitter and get rid of that. Now, this is also extreme. It can become extremely evil. Okay, now, this is very ugly. I've seen it. Okay, not even the Bible believing preacher is immune to this. Okay, um, as you've heard me teach many times, it's inevitable there's going to be splits, even in Bible believing churches. Why? Because we're all human nature. Now, the most dangerous thing about this thing is you're going to find out that in Good, godly, King, King James only, dispensational, right, doctrine, Bible-believing church, everything perfect church, that you can develop the greatest enemies out of there, the worst kind of fights. And it's, it's not becoming of a Christian. It's just so horrible. And even pastors can say something that's just so off. Members can say something that is so off that you would think that, is this even a church? And there are people who leave churches because they don't see the love of Jesus Christ in there. But what they're going to find out is this happens to everybody, not just Bible-believing churches. So it's inevitable in everybody's life. So the point is this. It can become extremely evil. That's the bottom line. That even unbelievers think, if this is Bible-believing Christianity, I don't want anything to do with it. And I'm talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about extremely wicked unbelievers too which we deem to be very wicked and not holy like us Bible-believing Christians, but when they see us with our bitterness and then this thing going on in the church, they think that we're the evil ones. Yeah, that's right. yeah. What does that mean? If lost people see saved people as that evil, you must be really bad. So let's go to James. James. That's the reason why I always keep my mouth shut. I don't even say it. And if I have that bitterness in my heart, I immediately turn that over in prayer. I immediately dig up by the roots and pluck it up one by one. And guess what? Those roots just keep coming back. Why? Because the devil is the one that sows the seeds of bitterness. So every time you get rid of uh, one root and then the seed, he's going to spread another one. Why? Because you perceive something from somebody because somebody said it that way or you saw something and you perceived it that way. He's got plenty of seeds in his bags and it's called one thought here, one feeling in your heart here, something you perceive from somebody, something you perceive from the event and the way they looked at you and talked at you, which had nothing to even do with it. That's what bitterness does. It's so evil and dangerous. If you look at James chapter 3, <clears throat> notice right here, when uh, we look at verse uh, 10, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Look at verse 8. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Look at verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body. Remember bitterness defileth? Remember that one at Hebrews 12? Okay. This tongue is defiling everything. It's spreading out. Defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. See, it's like a wildfire spreads around through the nature. So everyone's infected. Is the context bitterness? Bitterness is included because if you look at verse 14, but if you have what? Bitterness. Bitter envying and strife in your heart. See that? It's rooted. But then it comes out of your mouth. The tongue spreads it out like a poison and you can't take back what you say. Yeah. Glory not and lie not against the truth. Now look at this. The James is asking... How can out of the same mouth proceed these blessings but also cursings? That's, that is not becoming of a Christian. Do you understand that? How can you honestly sing uh, 
leaning on the everlasting law, arms. What a fellowship, what a joy, be, uh, joy divine. And then I love you, brother. I love you, sister, you know, during handshaking time, during the piano playing. I mean, how can you do that while at the same time there's bitterness there? You know what that is? Well, I'm being smart about it. No, you're being smart about it? Verse 15, this wisdom, smart, huh? You're good at hiding it. You're good at saying pious stuff. You're a very sweet Christian. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. That's evil. I, one thing that really gets on me is w whether you're a member or a Bible-believing pastor, the worst thing you can do is pull up a victim mentality card is when you're bitter against a person. You know why? You want someone to side with you. And when that happens, all that wisdom is evil, earthly, sensual, devilish. Why? Because they see piety. A person who's suffering persecution for the name of Jesus, whatever that means. And what happens is it's confusing to everybody when they see this. So when they see two people who are bitter at each other and they love God, they love Jesus, they're soul winners, they love people, they do whatever for God, but there's this ugly evil that comes out. What happens? Confusion, verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Confusion. And then brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, everyone trying to pick sides and teams, you know, well, do you believe what I'm saying? And then, you know, that is so evil because you're, what you're doing is you're trying to get them to turn on each other. Come on. You don't want to do that. Good advice. Someone bitter says something to you, say, that's, I don't want to be a part of that. Yeah. All right, let's go back. This is a very evil thing. You don't realize that. You got to be very careful of bitterness. The devil's going to use that because lost people are watching you. Your lost family and loved ones are watching you. And when they see you talk bad about the church you used to attend, when they told you long time ago not to go to that church because they're a bunch of hypocrites. Anyone under conviction now? All right, let's go back. All right, now here's a weird thing, all right? Here's a weird thing. Go to 1 Peter. Go to 1 Peter. Uh, not 1 Peter, excuse me. Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Now here's the real funny thing. You ready for this, men? Okay. Usually what you're going to find in churches is that this bitterness is very, uh, is very common amongst uh, female church members. But when it comes to marriage... Listen, okay? Listen. When it comes to marriage, it's pretty obvious it's going to be the woman, but God never mentioned that about women. He said that about the men. Wait, wait, wait. wait. That is the opposite. I thought it definitely, I mean, if women have that problem in the church more than the men, obviously in the marriage, it's going to be the woman that's a problem. No, it's the men. Look at Colossians chapter, yeah, amen. Yeah, the men are quiet now, all right? You're probably saying amen because that didn't apply to you, but now here we go, okay? All right, now go to Colossians 3, 18. All right, the husband's favorite verse, all right? Colossians 3, 18. Why submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord? Yeah, amen, bless God. All right, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and what? Ain't that weird? Shouldn't that be applied to the women, especially if they're submitting under a messed up husband? That, I don't get it, unless the Holy Spirit has a reason. Because God is smarter than you and I. All right? Here's the thing, okay? Women don't have to tell you men if they got a problem. Men, okay, you can talk about being in charge of the home and the wife should submit under you, but you do know this, even though with that special power that you got and that special authority, you're still scared more of your wife than your wife is scared of you. Why? Because we don't believe in stomping out women. See, that's the thing. That's why bitterness is not the issue here for women. 
Men are supposed to treat the women well, right? We know that. Love your wives as much as Christ loved the church, gave himself for it, right? Amen. So then bitterness, how the Lord sees it, is not much of an issue for the wives then. Because if they got a problem, you're going to find out, right? They're quiet with you. Honey, did I do something wrong? And you don't even know what you did wrong, you know? And then, oh, you're going to find out, okay? But why is it the men, they suffer bitterness? Because you can't get away with it as much as the wife would, all right? Because what happens is you have to play the good guy, you think. This, now, this is a male mentality, all right? So women, please don't be hard on us, all right? But I'm just telling what the men think, all right? To be empathetic toward them. The male is, I did everything for this wife, and then here I am, you know, uh, I'm scared of her, but she doesn't respect me one bit. I can't, I can't get mad at her. I can't say this because she's really going to get mad at me and she's going to win at the end. And what happens is you men, you keep it down inside your heart and then you're always judgmental of your wife. And what happens is, in your mind, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get amens from the husband. You're, this is all in your mind. When you're out with your wife, you're going to think, oh, she's going to say this. She's going to do this. She's going to tell me this. She's going to get upset at this when she can't get upset. And in your mind, you think you're 90% right when it happens. So then you get in, you already made a judgment you already pulled up a psychological profile of your wife and you assume that she's always going to be like this type of woman. And then that judgment is going to stay in your heart. And if you're not careful, just one time is enough where you might judge her wrongly and it might hurt her bad. And you know this, your wife's going to take it hard compared to you. All right. So that's going to be very bad. You better be careful with your words, guys. Right. Why? Because that came from bitterness, right, not because you know your woman. It came from bitterness. Right. That's why. Do you know why God does that? Because notice the context is love your wives. You see that? Yeah. Love your wives. You know what that forces you men to do? It forces you to be more understanding forces you to be patient, and you realize yourself that you got your own problems. Men are, can be very impatient creatures, and they lack gentleness, understanding, and caring for people. That does happen. All right? Yeah, amen. Good, good. I'm hearing amen here. If you don't think so, then wait till you get married, okay? And what's going to happen right here, I thought, look, I pastored a church for over 10 years before I got married, and I thought, it's hard to believe, I was the most loving, understanding person, patient person in the world. Then when I got married, I realized I got anger issues, okay? <laughs> no, no. no, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. Then I was like, wow, I, it was like eye-opening to me. So what did I do? I had to pluck it deep down inside my heart immediately. I did it immediately because I didn't want that bitterness to get over there. And I look at my wife wrongly for years to come all the, like that. I don't want that in my life. Amen. Now, uh, if you compare that with uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 5, and we're going to wrap it up here. There's a lot more that I could say about bitterness, but we don't have time. So we already reached the time. So let's go to Ephesians. <clears throat> let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, okay? Ephesians chapter 5. And then verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now this matches with Colossians, right? So in order not to be bitter, you got to love them. That's what heals a heart. What heals a heart against bitterness toward your wife, husbands, is that you've got to love her. How much should I love her? I already put up, I mean, I, I had it right here. You don't know my wife. Well, you don't, you don't know much about yourself. Jesus Christ, he knows a lot about you, and yet he was patient enough with you. 
So you think that you're the one who has the greatest patience in the world and, you know, you can't put up with your wife? How much did Jesus Christ have to put up with you men? A lot more than you put up with your wife. Jesus Christ put up with them. He understands their infirmities and he died for them. He gave himself up sacrifice for that. Now, you men willing to do that, See, we're, we're all into the submission wagon, you know, that uh, you listen to me, you obey me. Well, maybe she'll listen to you if you treat her well. Well, I do treat her well. That's what you think. See that? But then when you dig up the root, you find more problems with yourself. You're not as soft as you thought. You're not as understanding as you thought. You're not as loving as you thought. And I speak that as a witness myself, too. Because the pastor's position is one of those ultimate sacrificial positions, obviously, for giving yourself to the people. But when I got married, I realized, wow, I'm very surprised. There's still a lot of self-centeredness in there. All right. So there's a lack of softness there. So you have to see that about yourself, okay? Uh, and then Ephesians, this is the last one, Ephesians 6. Uh, five, excuse me, we're still at five. No, uh, four, excuse me, four, four. This is one of the other famous verses on bitterness. In connection to that, the Bible says in verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be, look at this softness, right? Be what? Kind one to another, tender hearted. If that ain't soft, I don't know what that is. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you, as much as Jesus Christ was soft on you. So, there's that lack of, lack of softness on our side. So we need that in our lives, and that helps get rid of bitterness. Now, this is, in a marriage context, we see that for husbands, but you notice this is also universal, right? Yeah. And that's why, I mean, ladies, you're not going to get away with it either. Everybody has this problem. They lack softness, even though you think you're soft enough. Because you just have to think about how much Jesus Christ was soft on you. How much he was able to put up with you. When you do that, that helps a lot with the bitterness. So you need to do that. Whatever is hiding underneath the ground, it's time for you to inspect it. Please do not look at the bitterness above the ground, okay? What you outwardly done. That's a huge mistake everybody does. You didn't do it yet, obviously. You didn't make any mistake yet, outwardly. But it's in the ground. You need victory against that one more than outwardly. All right? That's why people think that they have no bitterness because I didn't do anything outwardly yet. I didn't say anything yet. But it's down there at the heart. You got to get rid of that thing. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to our hearers. Help them to grow more in knowledge of the scriptures and also to apply to their lives and change. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.